Professor Zhao, um, Shanghai topped the PISA tests for the second time running. Should New Zealand be following China in the way that it teaches its children? Well, absolutely not. I don't think that New Zealand should follow uh, China or Shanghai in particular in its way of teaching children because uh, simply uh, they, what, how they got there is what precisely we have to abandon. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with the Chinese system? Well, the Chinese system has been there for a long time. It's when evolved from the Kezhi system or the imperial exam system, which was designed to homogenize people, uh, to turn people into compliant citizens. And uh, so by um, scoring high on the test, which shows how well they've complied with the authority. Okay, so Shanghai, 15-year-olds, have got well, have aced the test for reading, for maths, for science. Is it about teaching to the test rather than critical thinking or creative thinking? What does PISA tell us? Well I think I don't think the Chinese actually teach children to the test of the PISA in particular, but the Chinese system is a huge system of test preparation. And as you know, you know if you test well that means you know how to find answers effectively and fast. And finding answers is not the same as being different, which is uh, necess necessary for being creative and being critical. So here you have, you've learned all the time to give the authority the answer they desire. And creativity and critical thinking requires to tr challenge the authority in a very different way. So what should we be aiming to do with children in terms of teaching them how to think for the things that they will need in the 21st century? Well, I think what we need to do is, uh, is to uh, trust the human nature, that human beings are naturally curious and creative. And creativity and curiosity drives learning and drives you to explore and invent. Uh, because in 21st century, uh, we will not be able to predict the jobs, the society in the future. So our children need to be adaptive and creative, and that there is no answer to give them, to prepare them for that future. So what do you think about standardized testing then? Well, more standardized testing, if they simply use as a guide, if we know for sure the domain and the content, you should learn it can be very useful. For example, if you're learning to become a mechanical engineer, there are certain things you should know. You, but you have to be sure in the beginning you want to become a mechanical engineer. Or you know the mechanical engineering for the next five years might be like this. So it can guide you to say this. Or you want to become, I don't know, a, a ballet dancer or Pilates trainer or karate. Yeah, there's a certain process. But beyond that, it's not of much use. So standardized testing may be useful for limited, well-defined domain in terms of instruction and simple learning, but for education it has no place. Okay, let's talk about the political side of this, because when New Zealand fell from 18th to 7th in something, you know, or in science or whatever it was, there was consternation, you know, and finger pointing in Parliament, look what you did. Um, there was a desire um, amongst some politicians, perhaps not quite so much about parents, but it may be, to know where does the school rate in the great scheme of things? Where does my child rate in the great scheme of things? What do you think about all of that? Well, there are many, many ways to, to think about. First of all, I think it's very naive for any politician or the public to even believe uh, you know, a change of a place within three years or six years uh, indicates a decline or increase of your education system. No system responds that fast. Even if you want to ruin the New Zealand education, you can't do it so fast in three years. You couldn't, if you planned. So I would question the test score more than question our quality. I mean, how can you also, you cannot build it up within three years e either. And so any blame is just, it's nonsense. It's just, you can't say, you design, you, you kind of cause this downfall. You can't. You cannot ruin New Zealand in three years. So that's just number one. Number two, I think, the, with the ranking of schools, it's very dangerous. When you rank something, it's you basically serve as a selector. You know, as in terms of evolution, the environmental pressure forces species to adapt to it. Now, if you use one or two ways to select schools, students, or teachers, or reward and punish principles, you are going to homogenize them. And New Zealand is not going to survive as a homogenous country, even though it's small. We also have, happening at the moment, 
the idea that has been used in the United States, that we should pay good teachers more than bad teachers. Well, I have two questions. The first is, how do you decide between a good teacher and a bad teacher? And the second is, do, do, is it a good idea to give pay incentives to teachers? Well, I think the, the, the first question is, is uh, we, we don't know how to tell a good teacher from a bad teacher truly, other than use a standardized test scores, which is, of course, is misleading. I mean, I think a good teacher uh, uh, versus a bad teacher has to do a lot more with uh, do you create a good environment to cultivate uh, students' learning rather than test scores. And also there's the issue of long-term gain versus short-term. Like, for example, sometimes uh, short-term, you may show the rise of test scores but you may have damaged students' interest in learning. So that's the big challenge, I think. Uh, but now we assume, uh, again, we meaning the politicians, assume that we know how to measure that. So you can get it turned into a one simple score value added. That's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that um, a lot of research shows uh, test scores uh, or incentive uh, pay do not really generate better test scores necessarily. And they don't know the damage. Uh, that, that's not, and another problem, of course, with the, the pay is that you change the nature of teaching. A lot of people get into teaching, it's not really about money, unless the money is a lot. And if there's huge difference, most people go in there to not try to get rich, and, or they couldn't get rich, and they view that. So once you change the mission or nature of the job from uh, they think it's a spiritual, uh, it's, a, it's a contribution to society into a money-making scheme, and uh, you may actually de-incentivize a lot of people. And there's been some cheating as well. If you, t if you tie the pay incentives mm -hmm. to the achievement and tests mm -hmm. of children, mm -hmm. then you get some bad things happening. Yeah, it's, it's much more than that. You know, be, uh, it's not only the money. Any kind of standardized testing with high stakes can cause corruption. Cheating is one way, it's, uh, especially in cases where uh, the stakes are so high and no one can afford to lose, or the incentives are so great and you're not going to, you know, uh, but you are not able to truly change the system. The This uh, kind of uh, risky way is to uh, cheat. I mean, what's wrong with an authoritarian type of education system. I mean, after all, the world's run that way. You know, large corporations are, are now running the world. Uh, do as you're told and you'll do all right. What's wrong with that? Why shouldn't we teach our children to be like that? Well, honestly, there's nothing wrong if you want authoritarian culture because uh, if author authoritarian systems do very well in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, but the problem is that we don't know exactly what the future holds. I mean, for example, if you know what exact products you want to make, authoritarian system makes it very effective and efficient. And the problem is that there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. And also, it's the same way as we think about um, uh, planting or, or I mean, New Zealand is to ship. As a, so we can now genetically modify ship. And you found one type of ship that grow really fast and fatter, tastes better, that's very effective, right? Let's, let's think about the wine approach. Then the New Zealand government said, okay, we'll be authoritarian. All farmers shall grow, grow this type of ship, which is, again, it's beautiful. If nothing changes, it's great. But what if there's a disease? What if climate changes? What if some pe people get, begin to get tired of ship? You know, they want to do something else now. And what is going to happen by then? All the other variety of ship have died. So it's very effective, very efficient, but... We don't know what the future holds. So what's an education for anyway? Well, I mean, the, the, a lot of people think education is to prepare people to be employed. I mean, there's a lot of debate. We also debated education to pass on the old tradition and cultural values, to formulate communities and, uh, and to uh, enable individuals to pursue a, a happy life. I think in my, my thinking, I think actually education is to provide opportunities for individuals mm. to liberate themselves, mm. to become better than themselves, and through which you know, they'll become a contributing member of a community. It is to enhance individual capacity. 
How do we increase fairness? How do we increase equity in a public education system? How do we make sure that every child has the opportunity to go as far as he, her or his abilities will allow? Well, that's, that's a great question about fairness, about openness. I think in now, you know, in, in the 21st century, we have a lot more access to information, which used to be unequally distributed, which actually brings the, the part that no matter where you are, in most developed countries, you generally have access to information. So in that case, that's pretty good already. And the traditional schools actually, uh, because it's defined by local poverty levels, sometimes uh, disadvantage of that. You know, by putting kids in a school, you're depriving children of access to other places. Mm -hmm. But that's not the key. I think the key is that we often confuse education opportunity with education content. For example, to equalize education opportunity, I believe in equal funding across a national system, across, you know, hope on a global system, but which will never happen. But uh, uh, a government interpret as uh, content equality. So they prescribe the same content, the same curriculum, the same outcome, the same standards, the same teachers, which actually is not equal. And for example, the Chinese education system, most people think it's meritocracy. They think meritocracy is actually equal. It is not equal. A meritocracy rewards people who happen to have the abilities that's been tested. Mm -hmm. It is actually uh, discrimination against other talents. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Brian, I don't know how well you are or you were at math, you know, and, uh, okay. if you were not good at math, you know, but if I'm using math to select people to be you know, rewarded with great social uh, status, you know, you would not be one. So that's discriminating against you. But it looks like a very objective, fair way to guarantee distribution of resources. We're not. Well, the other thing is I can't remember the last time I used a quadratic equation. But uh, the skills of communication, of language, of ability to, pe pe to persuade people to do <laughs> things they don't want to do, those are all the things that have got me through in life. Uh, learning philosophy it got me through to, to having this interview with you now. We don't measure those sorts of things in children. We don't measure your ability to dance, mm -hmm. to sing. Um, but uh, New Zealand children, uh, are young people, are doing extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. Lord has uh, uh, got uh, a, a double Grammy and a hit record around the world. I don't know what her PISA results would have been. Um, well, actually, those are very interesting observations, but we, we may run into another danger. You know, it's that I'm, by the way, very much like you. I, I'm lucky that um, I was able to uh, not do well in math and still have a chance to do something else. I've all, you know, I'm a, in many ways, I'm a, also always said I'm a failed peasant, you know, that is, I'm not a good peasant, and my father allowed me to do something else. So, so yeah, I've always been running away from my failures or my inabilities. So, so, but it's very dangerous, too, to say, because we are good at certain things. Therefore, we demand others to be good at the same thing. So, you know, we have the people who believe in STEM, people believe in dancing and art, they say, want everybody to know art. I think we commit the same crime if we think what we are good at shall be known by others. So I wanted to kind of backtrack this, okay. A good education is one that provides opportunities for almost everybody to find something to do or to feel good about. So it's an individualist approach, really. I, yeah, yeah, I, I think, so. and it's, of course, the, the hidden behind that could be the challenging question to say, well, if we want to make sure everybody's individual, how do they work together as a community, which I wouldn't worry too much. Human beings are born to be social. You know, we got to work and get along with other people. So if you were advising the New Zealand government about restructuring or reforming education in New Zealand, what would you suggest to them? What would you advise them? I would... Uh, well, the first thing I would say, back off from any attempt to nationalize the education outcomes for every child, every student. Do not compare them. Acknowledge individuals and also remove the idea that certain groups are better or worse. You know, the Maori, you know, for people is a great example. We always think they lack certain things compared to the you know, traditional Anglo-Saxon, I, I think, uh, uh, white middle class, uh, but they may have their strength. So the first thing, back off from nationalizing standardized outcome measures applied to all children. Second thing, I would not spend so much time and money to debate over curriculum. 
allow children to develop their own curriculum. And with this technology, you can have personalized curriculum, personalized education, rather than implementation of a national curriculum. Third, I will not try to fix teachers. I will not I will try to fix students. You know, a good student should be able to survive any bad teaching and bad teacher. And fixing teachers takes too long. And today, nobody, no system has been working on turning students into entrepreneurial learners. They create their own learning opportunities. Teachers is just a part of that. So do we need to be teaching creativity and entrepreneurialism to our children? And if, if so, why? Now, I wouldn't teach entrepreneurism or creativity. That's just part of a humanity. We, we are born to be creative, to be entrepreneurial. We may have different degrees of entrepreneurial spirit in ourselves. We should allow that to grow. I think enable that. And I've already said the Chinese system or Asian systems, uh, Singaporeans, Koreans, Japanese, they don't teach creativity uh, any worse or we don't teach creativity any better than Asian systems. We just killed less successfully so far by being less homogene homogeneous. How do Chinese educationalists cope with you? And what's the reaction? Well, they don't. The Chinese don't cope with me. I'm, I'm not there, you know, so I'm, I'm out here. I'm, uh, you should ask, how do Americans cope with me now? I've lived in the U.S. for 20-some years, and uh, I, made, I represent a challenging voice. You know, honestly, a lot of times, I don't really believe the authority uh, uh, bother with me, but they allow me to express, to talk. I still go back to China, and they, they invite me to talk. I still chat with them, but uh, uh, I view my, my fight or my, my role right now is really about thinking about the future of the world, not about China or not about the U.S. Uh, I'm trying to encourage countries like New Zealand, like uh, Australia, like uh, U.S., which have had a more liberal tradition to continue to be more liberal rather than trying to be more authoritarian. Do you think there has been a tendency over the last 30 years for education to focus on what are you going to do for a job? Are you, uh, are you tailoring your education uh, towards the workplace? Rather than coping with your life in the future and everything that it will throw to you or developing all of those talents that you've got. Do you see that as a trend as you look around the world, the Western world? Yeah, I think in the Western world, definitely the, the public discourse has been more about preparing yourself for a job. So this, we, we have the rise of the business sector to come to describe these are the skills and talents we want, therefore schools should equip them with these talents and skills. Uh, East Asian countries have always been like that. It's talk about pre getting the exam done, being employed by the em emperor, how to do their work. I think Western, yes, we have a narrow, we have narrowed the purpose of education towards employee training. And it's important to be prepared for the world, isn't it? But what's the, what's the danger in having a narrow focus on job employment as your main purpose in education? What's well, you're right. It's, it's important to be prepared for the world. But the world is not only jobs. Is that, and jobs change so fast. So the danger of that is that we, the traditional model of education, when we be prepared for a job, but the job is always in the past. If you could describe what the job requires, the job should have existed for a while. If the job has existed for a while, it's most likely to disappear in the future. So you cannot really have the certainty. The second thing is that a lot of the jobs we describe in the past is a description of cognitive skills and content knowledge. And cognitive skills may be important, but what's actually get coming up to be more important for you to become adaptive are the non-cognitive skills. I think you've talked about getting prepared for the creative economy. Mm -hmm. That, when I read that, a penny dropped in my head. That's how old I am. I talk uh -huh. about pennies, you know. Because when I think about myself and what, we're, what I'm doing right now, I'm telling stories. Mm -hmm. And in my house, there's a builder um, building part of my house at the moment. Uh -huh. He's doing a real job. I'm telling stories, uh -huh. as I used to think. But the creative economy is becoming more and more, isn't it? We don't have an industrial economy quite so much. Should we be preparing our children for a different economy? Yes, actually, 
I have a same kind of story. My father, who is 87, lives still in China, has been farming all his life. And uh, he produces rice, sweet potatoes, and uh, drives the water buffalo. He would never believe that I can make a living by talking to people. You know, that, that's just, he, he doesn't know what I do. And he hopefully I'm not uh, kind of playing scams on people. The, the only bad people do those things in my village and just talk your way out of, you know, some <laughs> problem. It's the, the, but the, the, the thing is that uh, society has changed. We've come to a different age, which we consume a lot more spiritual, psychological products than physiological products. You know, the, the physiological uh, survival used to rely on food, shelter, and clothing. Now, our well-being relies a lot more on personalization, choices, creation, art, in a very different type of society, which we've always done. It's, it's very different anyway. They just. I was thinking the other day that, you know, as I thought about robotics and things like that, mm -hmm. that uh, there are less jobs for people in their bodies. Mm -hmm. and, but then I thought, we, ne we now have professional athletes, professional league players, mm -hmm. professional rugby players, uh, professional cricket players, yeah. in a way that we didn't have before. So people are still doing jobs with their bodies, mm -hmm. but it's different. Oh, it's dramatically different. You know, what, what are the, you know, the useless people, what I call traditional useless people have become very useful now. You know, I use the example of Kim Kardashian, it's a good example. She would have been useless in most of the time in human history. Now, boom, you know, she's become valuable in some way. The so so you call those, those cricket players, you know, the dancers, the musicians, a lot of them would be have been not very valuable. They might be useful, you know, like, you know it's but not very valuable. Today, because we consume different products and people create those products have become a lot more valuable. You know, human beings, we've always moved from consuming mass products toward personalized products. Choice is something very few people uh, understand is actually a product that we require individuals to be diverse. So thinking about our education system, we need to allow children and students to have the opportunity to be able to develop all of these other areas that aren't, that aren't easily tested by standardized testing. Yeah, that, that's not only that, but also curriculum. When you have a national curriculum, how do you know what other talents we have? A national curriculum, by definition, is discriminatory. It's against other talents. When you do, you think literacy, literacy is most important, what about others? And if children were not given the opportunity to explore, to find out their strength, they may never have a chance. Media gave you, Brian, a chance to identify your strength, but you wouldn't. I always thought I could have become maybe a Justin Bieber, a better Justin Bieber. <laughs> yeah, but, in, but in my village, I never had a chance to have access to music. Yes. I would not even know, by now, I mean, until I die, I wouldn't know if I had a chance. Yes. Because once you miss the opportunity to know what you might be good at, yes. you will never be able to, chance to recover. Or you could do it maybe 50 years later. That's too late. I mean, the, the people re, uh, relied on YouTube. I did not have the, any of those. So a, a good education should provide enough opportunity for everybody to identify, explore, play with the, their own potential, not something the government thinks is important for you. So part of your education should be teachers developing in you the resilience, the self-esteem, the confidence to be able to go and explore your own talents, yeah? Yes, it's teachers. Teachers cannot develop anything in me or in you or in any student. Teachers help students develop. They create environments. My view is now a good teacher is a good curator of learning opportunities. Like in a museum, you curate chances for me to try different things, you know. You can plan a pathway environment that gives me enough feedback to say, this is something I can do, something I cannot do. If this is something, if I try it more time, I can do better. So that's the kind of things. But you really can't say, okay, Brian, I'm gonna help develop your resilience tomorrow. You can't do that, you know, it's just, that's us. But I can say to you, Young, you have a lovely sense of humor. You, have you ever thought about being a comedian? I could, and I, <laughs> if I lose a job in education, I'll try to be a comedian. That, 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 that's possible, <laughs> true. It is just, but however, I think, Brian, it, it's important to see is that um, in education, do we actually help children to become comedian? 
You know, we have a lot of, you know, the jokers in our class. Every class has a joker. Every class has a class clown, you know. That is some talent that we never recognize as something important. We, we see that as uh, disruptive. Exactly. You're yeah. just, uh, you're being smart, you know. Yeah. No, one, no teacher turns around and says, you're very clever. You sometimes yeah. make me laugh. Yeah. Have you thought about being a comedian? That's right. And also, we never gave them a chance because no one is born comedian. Even a good comedian takes time to practice. What if the teacher says, hey, I'm going to create a comedy club for you. Why don't you try this? And then we will help you improve to become a better comedian, not a better mathematician. <laughs> are charter schools a good idea or not? Well... It's just like asking if God is a good idea. It's, 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 it's well, not the charter schools are God. I think the reason is charter school is just one form of one idea, trying to provide choices. I think the idea is that uh, if a school system has enough choices, you don't have to do something. And the, the, the record of charter schools in the U.S. is very mixed. Some of them really bad, some of them really good. It's, uh, it's like schools. And also the U.S. is already a very fragmented education system. We've got tens of thousands of school districts. It's the, so what I think the key here is whether a charter, magnet, private, whatever schools you call them, do we have a system that provides children a diversity of learning opportunities? The same thing about global competition. Like New Zealand, for example, you get four million people. New Zealand has to be more New Zealand to win the competition rather than trying to become more like China. That's the key. A lot of systems is the same thing. If I were New Ze in New, on New Zealand, I would completely get out of PISA. Because PISA scores can, it's like a straight jacket. It, it forces you to respond to a few test scores. It's almost, it's ironic, you know, there's otherwise smart people listening to three test scores to dictate their children's future. They believe the three scores reflect how hard their teachers worked, how smart their children are, and how well they're gonna fare in the future. I can't believe why you have those naive people who believe this. I tell you what, if they had a test in Kapahaka, we would be number one. <laughs> <laughs> Possible, right? Yeah, yeah. Look, I can just hear people in New Zealand listening to you and going, but we need to be able to assess teachers, we need to be able to assess students, we need to know where we're going with all of this. Well, let's think this way. Humanities, especially in Western developed countries, did not have a test to have an industrial revolution, to have the information revolution. The countries had tests, stopped, innovated. China had tests since the 600s. Japan adopted, Korea adopted. They all stopped developing. Testing is the way, the best way to stop innovation. Because testing, first of all, presents something. This is something we need. This is where you are. You consume human energy to guess other people's answers. And it will be important for employees, certain jobs. But honestly, those kind of skills. But in 1987 in New Zealand, parents went from being parents to consumers because the business model was applied. And consumers want to know, I'm spending this money. What's the result for all of this? What do you say to that? Well, that's a horrible idea. For, for, it's for children are not products. Children cannot be specified products. That's, that's the very key. Children. Uh, also, parents are not consumers either. Parents and students are co-participants of a community. They're all members. We should construct this whole thing together. You are not hiring teachers to fill your children's uh, brain with something. You are working together to help this grow. So I like the kind of uh, community ideas. We have a village. We have a bunch of new trees. We want to help them grow. You know, you're not, even if you hired some, you know, gardener come over here to do this, the work for you, you are still have to have your passion, your love to grow together. It but I've just been in a school in New York where the founder of the school said, we don't have any parents on our school board because we are the experts, we are the educators, give us your children and we'll give you the, we'll give you the result. I mean, what about that? Well, that's, that's just silly. You know, remember, schools is only occupied six hours a day, five days a week. Children I mean, are with their parents or in the neighborhood a lot much longer than in the school. 
And also remember, they come to school when they're five or age six. They've already been working with them. You cannot possibly say, I'm going to deliver what I want you to know, unless you kind of like the, the ancient, I, th I think, uh, the Greek, the Spartans, you know, just take the children away from others. You know, the, way the state owns the children. You, you can't do that. I think the, I do believe um, uh, education is more enculturation. Is about growing in the general area. But Brian, let me just get back uh, a little bit uh, with the issue of creativity. Mm -hmm. So far, many people believe creativity is a cognitive skill or a set of cognitive skills. You can think differently. But more and more research, and I firmly believe, uh, creativity is, has a lot more to do with the non-cognitive. Mm -hmm. That is very content and context specific. For example, you may be creative in many different ways. But you won't be able to greatly creative or productively creative in everything. I mean, you may be great with images and interviews, Brian. That's a, but it will be hard for you to do the same in my village to drive my water buffalo or, or the, the same. So, and you choose to do that. So, so a lot of times we have a standardized test. You test creativity. You are testing the very abstract, isolated things. And pe when people are not interested, you cannot be creative. When you are not ener energized, you're not going to be creative. I mean, you, you do certain projects. You know, you, you're, in, you're passionate about social justice. Mm -hmm. On this topic, you can be very creative, but what if I ask you to film, I don't know, maybe let's say uh, the makings of a robot, you know. You might be interested, but if you had no interest, you're not going to be passionate. So creativity has to be driven something from the heart. It's my observation that when I was a teacher in New Zealand, we used testing as a kind of analytical device. It wasn't ever competitive. We, we would test children, but it was to try and figure out what was your issue in reading or what was your issue in maths so that we could help you develop. You know, most children are here at about that stage, but you're ahead of it or you're not, or should I be teaching you less about that or whatever. It seems to me that testing has become less of a tool and more of a weapon. Uh, to beat teachers over the head with, uh, to beat schools over the head with. Is that a fair analysis or am I being a little... Different? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Testing, especially in Western countries, now have been used as a, as a way to drive teachers, uh, you know, so to hold schools accountable, uh, less as a diagnostic tool. We have this whole thing about accountability of teachers, you know. Um, when I was a teacher, people just accepted me as the teacher, and I had, there was a certain status about that. Now it seems that, you know, you have to be accountable. Um, and again, we get back to this business of how you decide what's a good teacher and what's not. What do you make of this accountability of teachers? Well, I think the accountability, simply speaking, is that we, we don't trust that you are able or willing to do the work. So we want to make sure, you know, uh, you can do it. The negative consequence is just simply that we are treating teachers as uh, even worse as slaves. So you, unless they have a whip you know, over your head, you're not going to work. And uh, that, that's an assumption. And uh, the, the second thing is that we, we, we tend to um, mechanize the process too, that we assume we can actually have accountable measures. That's two simple test scores. We're treating this uh, you know, uh, education as building a great wall. Mm -hmm. you know, as long as you put enough sweat, you can build a big wall. There's no wisdom, no thinking, no passion required. You don't need passion to pile the bricks up there. And, uh, and uh, then you can, in order to evade uh, any punishment, you better put 100 uh, bricks every day up there, we think. And third of all, you, you definitely corrupt the teaching process that uh, teachers will teach to the test. And by the way, I actually think uh, uh, test-based uh, accountability is a violation of child labor law. Mm. Well, you are compensating the adults based on uh, children's performance. Mm. It's children's contribution. Remember, I think we're exploiting the children. Mm. We, uh, every teacher should, uh, uh, every, uh, as a parent, we should uh, sue the government. <laughs> you know, my children's uh, score, is work, is used to determine the compensation of an adult. I think that's wrong. So I'm going to say my children shall not contribute to adults in a salary. It's an interesting way of turning it around. But it's true. But I, I, yes, I think it is a question of trust, isn't it? We've, we've lost trust in people to do their job. Um, and 
I'm also wondering whether the mechanisms that we're putting in to make sure that you're doing a job, make sure you do these number of tests a week and do all of that, the paperwork is getting in the way of actual education, of spending time with a child. You know, education is fundamentally a, a very human process. True good education, not instruction, I mean. Uh, instruction means the transmission of knowledge or acquisition of skills, but education is really, I think, a mutual or uh, growth together in morally and emotionally. And that, that's, that's important. That's a human relationship. Once you mechanize it, it becomes more of, like you said, customer and, uh, and service-based. And that's not going to work. But, but uh, more importantly in the process, the loss of trust perhaps becomes less important than politicians or the public gaining a false sense of progress. Now we think we have science. Once you reduce things to test scores, we view that as scientific. And then once we apply that to schools, then we can sit back and say, okay, we're getting more A schools and fewer C schools, you know. And when, as parents, my children's getting from A to, you know, A plus. That's a false sense of progress. You are ignoring the damages we've done to others, and, and uh, what our children, if they're not growing in certain other domains. Have you seen any system, or been in any country, where you have seen a successful model of an attempt to provide equity in an education system? Because we don't have it at the moment. Um, and that's largely because things like property values have become associated with the you know, the good schools. And, um, and so it's very difficult now for us to, to see how we can provide equity across the system. Have you seen any system that works? Well, I think actually in terms of providing equity, uh, uh, creating equal education opportunities, uh, Finland will be a good example. I understand you'll be taught, talking to Pasi, that that's a good place. And uh, the... the Actually, I think they are Singapore. Singapore is a good one. They're trying to create schools, have the same system. But remember, there are really two parts of equity. One is, are the, school, are the schools equally funded and created and staffed versus are the children of equal or equal kind of origin or not? So you have the social inequity affecting the gaps of children coming to school versus are the schools equally funded? So it's two different types of things. I think in many countries, like, you know, now we confuse both of them. We're trying to change that. You know, I think in New Zealand, you know, you are trying to address the a schools equally funded or staffed. Mm -hmm. So you have you're giving more money to you have the diesel time, diesel tower schools. It's uh, by the way, I, I can't uh, help but uh, recount a story of, around into in New Zealand in the school. I went to one, one, a school which is really, I think, near Hawke's Bay. A beautiful school. It's a, not, the, not the school facility is beautiful. They have actually mobile classrooms, but their children are very happy. The principal working hard, very much fitting my philosophy of supporting education. And I said, how can you do this in the face of all this uh, you know, national curriculum and national um, assessment? He said, I just, just uh, you know, they just don't know what I do. And they, he just basically, uh, the principal, fabricated whatever government wants and protected the autonomy of the teachers. It's kind of sad, right? I think there's a bit of that going on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll, get, we'll fill the forms in and tell them what they want to know, yeah. but yeah. we'll actually educate the children. That's like in my book I call the fooling the emperor, you know, just yeah. deceive the emperor, make sure the emperor is happy. You know, the, but isn't that sad? In a democracy, we waste energy in trying to make the government happy which ostensibly is supposed to help us deliver better education.